Let us begin. How we'll do it. Good? Yes. Ambassador Program Part 3. Today's theme is going to be leadership. And I've put together a presentation just for you guys on really what is Jewish leadership all about. And I'm going to go from Moses to modern Israel. Seven principles of Jewish leadership. Are you all ready? Ready. Mm -hmm. Try that again. Are you all ready? Ready. Yes. Let's go. So first of all, what is Jewish leadership? We talk about Jewish leadership. What exactly are we talking about? So the phrase Jewish leadership is a little bit ambiguous because it could mean leadership by Jews. And that's what it could mean. But it also means leadership in a Jewish way, according to Jewish principles, ideas, Jewish history. And we're going to look at basically great Jewish leaders through Jewish history, but seven principles of leadership itself and see how it applies to the world, to ourselves, and to Jewish history. Let us begin at the beginning. And we're going to begin with Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And they're going to take us into principle one, which is leadership begins with taking responsibility. We're going to see a change from Bereshit, from Genesis, into Exodus, into Shemot. There is a big change and a shift that happens. It starts not so good in Bereshit, okay? Let's compare them. In Genesis, it says, God called out to man and said, Ayeka, where are you? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. Remember, they ate from the tree. What was the fruit of the tree? Anybody know? A fig. Hmm? A fig. A fig, actually, is absolutely correct. It doesn't say fig in the Torah. It doesn't say teina. It also doesn't say an apple. I'm actually reading a book right now um, by Benjamin Blech, called the Sistine Secrets, and they see that Michelangelo, who made the Sistine Chapel, he actually knew a lot of Kabbalah, and knew a lot of Midrashim, because he actually depicted it as a fig tree, interestingly enough. And no other Torah does say that, it says that in the deeper Jewish writings, so he must have been aware of that. Okay, so they ate from that, and the first thing when God says, where are you? What does that mean, where are you? He knows where he means God. What's he actually saying? Where are you? What have you done? How did you find yourself in this position? What should he have done? Adam should have taken immediate responsibility for eating of the fruit. Instead, he says, she gave it to me, he blames his wife. Who does she blame? What have you done? The woman serpent deceived me. It was the snake, the nachash. It wasn't my fault. It was the snake that did it. What's everyone doing? Blaming others not taking responsibility for their actions. If you want to be a good leader, you've got to take responsibility. Let's move down. We see Cain spoke with his brother Abel. Now they both had to bring sacrifices in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8 to 9. And it happened when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. Hashem said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Same question. Right? Where are you? Where's your brother? Does God know where Abel is? Of course he does. He's God. He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? A shomer, a chilom, Am I my brother's keeper? What's the answer to that question? Does he answer the question? The answer is not given. Why does he not say, actually, yes, you are your brother's keeper? Why did they say that? It's rhetorical. It's rhetorical, but it's meant to keep in your head every generation is meant to ask themselves this question, am I my brother's keeper? No one person can answer this. It's one of those questions that goes right through Jewish and world history, okay? So that we see in Genesis. Then we reach Shemot, the book of Exodus, things change. And then we see a change in the Bria and people, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown up, he went out to his brothers and saw their burdens. He saw an Egyptian hitting a Hebrew, one of his brothers. This is when he started to connect to her. He started to connect to his people. It took some time, but he was there. He turned this way and that way, and when he saw there was no man to respond to helping his brothers, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So we go from Bereshit, in Genesis, when everyone is taking care of themselves and taking no responsibility, to the beginning of Exodus, when Moshe Rabbeinu Moses is, I am responsible for other people. That's why it says in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, 
in a place where there are no leaders, strive to be a leader. You get to places and no one's taking responsibility over the people. Peter is saying, you're going to get to times and places where no one's going to step up to the plate. And what do you have to do? Become a leader. Because at the heart of Judaism, my friends, there are three beliefs we have about leadership. One, two, three. Number one, we are free. If you're not free, you can't help others. You can't take responsibility. Freedom, chayrut, as we call it, is a prerequisite for taking responsibility, as we're going to see a little bit later. Number two, we are responsible. We have achrayut to other people. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu, he felt responsibility to his sheep, and then he felt responsibility to his people. And number three, together, that's the important, we can change the world. You can't do it alone. It's going to need a group effort in order to make a change. As Winston Churchill, the great British Prime Minister from World War II said, the price of greatness is responsibility. It's a price. You want to be great, you've got to have responsibility. You've got to feel a responsibility for other people. Having said that, we just finished Purim, the Megillah, and it looks so good. Moshe Rabbeinu took responsibility, and Adam and Eve didn't, and Cain didn't, and Cain didn't. And suddenly we see someone else who took it. Her name was Esther, Esther the Queen. I think so. Yeah. And Esther was told by Mordechai that she had a special mission. And that responsibility that she took for her people was very, very unpleasant. Megillah to Esther, a Jewish man whose name was Mordechai. He adopted his uncle's daughter when her parents had died. And so daughter, the girl was finally featured. The king's decree was published. And many young girls were brought together to Shusha in the capital. Esther was taken into the palace. This is actually a painting by Rembrandt from the 1600s. He was very into biblical scenes, actually. Bachshver and Haman at the Feast of Esther. I said Haman. Thank you so much. <laughs> Are you people in the way? <laughs> right. So she was kidnapped. She was kidnapped against her will and taken to marry Ahash Perush. Mordechai replies to Esther, she didn't want to do it. And he says to go in and speak to him and tell him that you are Jewish. And Haman should not go and see the Jewish people. And he says, do not imagine you'll be able to escape in the king's palace any more than the rest of the Jews. He's like, you think you're safe in the palace? There you are all rich and famous, you think that they're not going to find you? You're one of the Jewish people. They will find you. And then he says something unbelievable. This is amazing. This is the highlight of the time of Gilad. If you persist in keeping silence at a time like this, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place. And who knows whether it was for such a time as this that you attain the royal position. What was he saying over here? Mordecai was saying something unbelievable to Esther. He was saying the reason you became queen was to save the Jewish people. Number one. Number two, don't think you'll be able to escape. They're going to find out you're Jewish and you're going to get killed. And number three, the Jewish people are going to be saved. Make sure you're the one that does the saving. Because if you don't do it, God will find someone else to take responsibility and to save the Jewish people. Your entire life comes down to one moment and this is it. It's an amazing statement. Because the same thing applies to us. Our entire life has to come down to one single moment and we have to make the right choice. He's saying you will not escape, find someone else, and your life has come down to this moment. If you don't grab it, you're missing your life mission. Yes? Well, for a moment it was very grand, so that this, it was obvious to him, but what about everybody else? It wasn't obvious. Doesn't that everybody else? It was not obvious to her at all. She thought she was going to die. That's why she fasted, and all the Jewish people fasted for three days. This was a big, big moment. And she didn't want to go. Because if she didn't get permission to walk in, she was going to get killed. Didn't that prophecy go through? Didn't she know? She did not know. She did not know. She did a prophecy. She was a prophetess. She knew she'd succeed. That's why he's telling her. And sometimes, you just have to jump in. Let's meet a character you don't actually realize from the Torah, but had a very, very big role to play in the splitting of the Red Sea. Let's have a look. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Hashem moved the sea with the strong east wind all night, and he turned the sea to dab land, and the water split. So if you read Exodus chapter 14, you would think that Moshe Rabbeinu had the merit of splitting the sea. That's what we like to, right? 
You saw the movie? Well, if not, you should read the book. And we all know that Moshe Rabbeinu split the sea, right? He held his staff out. But the Medrash and the Gemara tells us, actually, someone else was involved. His name was Nachshon ben Aminadab, one of the prince's family. The Jews had to prove their loyalty by plunging into the water. Nachshon ben Aminadab from the tribe of Judah, a different family, later to leave the tribe of Judah, was the first to obey the command of Moses. He walked forward, and the water went up to his ankles, and then the water went up to his knees, and it went up to his stomach, and then his mouth, and then it go over his nose, and then the sea split. And they say that he was actually the catalyst for the splitting of the sea. What do we learn from Nachshon? Sometimes you have to jump in. You know, it's interesting, I was actually in Israel uh, two years ago with a group. We went to see a, um, a military base, and they were called Nachshoni. So I said, why do you get the name Nachshoni? How do you get that name? He said something fascinating. He said, because when it comes to battle, we're the first ones to jump in. So they know the piece of Gemara, and they call themselves the Nachshon Brigade. You heard of them, Nachshon Brigade? Not easy. Sometimes you leave by jumping in, but sometimes you leave by running the opposite direction, which is not unusual, right? You have to leave, you have to get involved. Not always. <laughs> Leadership means knowing when's the responsibility and when the responsibility is too big for you. Before Pharaoh decreed in Egypt that Jewish male babies to be thrown in the Nile, he consulted three world leaders, Bilam, Job, that's Eov, and Jethro, Yisro, that's Moshe Rabbeinu's father-in-law, yes. The Medrash tells us that Bilam advised him to kill the Jewish babies, and he himself was killed eventually. Remember later on the Torah? Eov was quiet, and he was punished with great suffering. However, Jethro, Yisro, fled, and merited that his children became judges of the Jewish people. So Jethro says, this is too much responsibility. If I say kill them, it's bad. If I say nothing, is bad. I'm just going to run. He made the right decision. Some decisions are just too big. That was principle number one. Principle number two, no one can lead alone. We always need to be part of a pack. We need to be part of a group. As it says in Genesis, and God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Who's God talking to over here? Let us make man. Why doesn't it say, let me make man? Right, that's right. It's Rashi tells us something fascinating. Let us make man. These angels did not actually help the creation of mankind, even though when people read this verse in the future, they may make the terrible mistake of thinking there is more than one God. Right? Let us, Nasa Adam, the plural, could think, well, there's more than one God. Let's just don't worry about it. I'm not concerned about that. I am more concerned that people think that when it comes to teaching mankind, they don't know that it's important to be humble and the greater one should consult with others below them. So when God creates the world and creates mankind, he deliberately says, I'm going to speak to the angels about this. He didn't have to. I don't even know what that means to consult angels, but when it comes to creation, one of the greatest acts of humanity obviously. Hashem, God says, I can't do it alone. And we have to learn, we can't do it alone either. Actually, if you look at the Torah, it says that everything is good, except when you're alone. Seven times in Bereshit, in Genesis, we hear the word tov, good. Only twice in the whole Torah is a phrase, lo tov, not good appear. The first, one second, hold the question, right, put it in your head. The first when God says, it is not good for man to be alone. So not good is related to being alone. And I will make him a helper opposing him as a connector at Adam and Chava. What's the goal over here? The goal is they should become one flesh. So you aren't alone, but you have to find others to become one. Now here it's talking about marriage. But love Dafka. The second is when Yitro saw his father Moses leading alone, right? Moshe Rabbeinu was judging the people day and night. It was very stressful. And his father-in-law <coughs> said to his son, or Moshe Rabbeinu, and says, Lo tov, it's not good. You can't do this alone. You need to find other people to judge for you. The big stuff will come to you, and the small stuff will go to them. And so Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, selected judges who would help him with the smaller cases. So two times, Lo tov, 
both times things are not good, people are alone. Man is alone, or God, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, is judging alone. Yes? Okay, so, what does the word say about guardian angels? What? Guardian angels. Yes. Guardian angels? What? Guardian angels? It does in a number of places. Because I was thinking, why else would God decide to consult the angels besides to be respectful? It, no, not to be respectful, to teach a lesson. God is consulting the angels to teach a lesson to us that when it comes to leadership, He can't do it alone, and the greater one should always consult with those people below them, even if He doesn't need to. Do angels guard us? Yes, we see that a number of times. Here. That's a different kind of, of concept, but absolutely. We may come to that another time. Okay? So basically we're saying there's three types of leadership model that we have in Jewish thought. And they go like this. Number one, we have basically kings. Malachim. We all have kings. And want to name a famous Jewish king? David. King David. Solomon. King Solomon, right? We have priests. Kohanim. Anyone want to name a famous priest? Those famous priests. Aaron, Moshe Rabbeinu's older <laughs> brother, was a priest. What's the last one? The Nevi'im, the prophet. Someone name a prophet? Yeah. Jeremiah was a prophet. Mordechai was a prophet. Shmuel, right? We have many, many prophets. So we have three different forms over here. The king was political. By the way, you'll see many, most arguments that happen are between the king and the prophet. So these two never really got on very, very well. And the priests also got into fights. Right? The political leader, the king, got into a lot of trouble. The prophet, we'll see why in a second. The priest was a religious leader. Not the only one. That was their main job in the temple, helping, teaching. The prophet, however, was a visionary, a man or woman of ideals and ideas. So the political leader is getting to fight with the prophet. Right? That's when the battles happen. The Zion Shemur is a constant battle between those two. So in Judaism, leadership is an emerging property of multiple roles. You need to have kings. You need priests and you need prophets. Each one of them has a role. They're all important. They each have their own thing to play. Kings is only over the people from the line of kings. Priests are only people who are from the tribe of Levi, Kohanim. Prophets, that's open to anybody. Man, woman, no matter background. Just like intelligence can grow, prophecy can go. And that's the key one. The prophets, the visionary, looks to the future and creates something. Now, we don't have prophecy anymore because the Jewish people are no longer a prophet's organization. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Because among us, we have people, and we can develop in ourselves the ability to at least have a rough courage, some ability to have a vision of the future. Yeah, yeah. Before there was a king, who was governing Israel? So we had leaders, right? Moses was a leader, Joshua was a leader. They were referred to as kings. But we didn't have kings per se. No, like when they entered Israel. Like Joshua was the leader. <laughs> After people took over, we have the other, we have the Nevi'im, we have the prophets, we have the other leaders, the judges, right? Gideon, we had great people, male and female, who took on that role. And then we got to Israel, kingship eventually uh, started. We'll talk more about that. King Solomon, one of the most famous kings of Jewish history, he was the one who actually built the first temple in Jerusalem. His father, David, selected a site, built foundations. He built it. He's considered the wisest of all people. And even he made mistakes. I'll just throw that out there. Okay, says King Solomon, two are better than one. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has no one to pick him up. You've got to do it together. You cannot lead alone. Leading alone is a dictatorship. That is not the Jewish way. God says, I will create, I need the angels. The king, the prophet, the Kohen, always a team, always working together. That's number two. Principle number three. Leadership is about the future. It is vision driven. You need to propel yourself into the future when you want to create something. You want to build a school, a synagogue, an organization, a business, a family, always the same. All involve leadership and all involve looking into the future. Okay. 
That's why you see some people always about past accomplishments, and some people, you know, always about what I see. I, I've met a number of great leaders. You're going to hear from one in a couple of hours. And you see people always about the future. How can I build? How can I create? Even this organization you're in today. It says in Exodus, where do we see an example of this? Moses by the burning bush. And now behold, the outcry of the children of Israel has come to me, says God. Exodus chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. And I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians have oppressed them. Now go, take my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now Moses has a destination. What's the destination? The land flowing with milk and honey. He's given a double challenge. Number one, to persuade the Egyptians to let the Israelites go. Now that's going to be tough. Right? That's the whole Pesach story. Let my people go. But you know what's even harder? To persuade the Israelites to take the risk of going. You know what's harder to persuade the Jews to go than to get the Egyptians to let us go? The plagues came by the 10th plague. Pharaoh's like, get out of here. But most Jews actually didn't even want to go. 80% stayed behind. Only 20% left. What's he say to him? He says, by the way, why a burning bush? Why is that used as a symbol? Because it was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. He was saying the Jewish people are alive, but they're on fire, but they're not disappearing. This burning bush was a metaphor for the Jewish people. And he says, where am I standing? On holy ground. I take his shoes off. Right? Where the Jewish people are suffering, there is holiness that is connected to it. Right? And it was future driven. He was told, take them to the next land. Miriam, his older sister, was an even greater visionary than Moses. Not a great prophet, prophetess. But she was a prophetess, but she was a visionary. You see, the kings of Egypt said to Hebrew midwives, when you help the Hebrew women deliver, if it is a son, kill him. If it's a girl, let them live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt. Who are these midwives? He said, Miriam and Yocheved, her mother. They were two of the famous brothers, Shifra and Pua. So the king says, kill them. What did many couples do, including the parents of Moshe Rabbeinu, who was not born yet? What, what did they do? Amram and Yocheved, the parents of Moses, they separated. They said, anyone's going to be born, so they get killed. Okay? Pharaoh commanded his entire people, saying, every son will be born into the river, shall he throw him, and every daughter keep alive. Right after this, it says, a man went from the house of Levi, and he took from the daughter of Levi, the woman. Who is this? This is the parents of Moshe, Rabbein, Yochebed, and Amram. What happened? When they heard about this decree, they divorced. It was like, no. Miriam said, what are you doing? You're going to now stop men and women, boys and girls, being born. You're worse than Pharaoh. Pharaoh just wants to kill the boys. You're killing any potential boys or girls. So they remarried. That's this couple over here in Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. Moses and Miriam, sorry, Yochavid and Amram remarried. And from that, because Miriam told them this, their daughter, who was a young girl, under 10, I think, they remarried and they gave birth to Moshe Rabbeinu, who ended up saving the Jewish people. We see more from Miriam later on. When the Jewish people left Egypt a number of years later, she was an older woman at this point, and the sea had split for them, the Torah says, Miriam the prophetess, sister of Aaron, took the drum in her hand, and all the women went forth with her with the drums of the dancers. Miriam left with drums. What does that mean, she left with drums? What did the Jewish men leave with? Chamushim Yalu. They left with weapons of war, ready to fight all of the nations that would come attack them. What did Miriam leave with? Musical instruments. Why? Because she knew they were going to be successful, and they'd need to have a party and a big celebration in the desert. And she was right. She was a great visionary. What she started as a child, she continued later on. Everyone else was nervous. We're going to go to war. Miriam was, according to Torah, happy they should have a chance to sing. And she led singing in the desert after the redemption. Now, we have a number of Russians here today. Do you recognize this man over here? Yes. Yeah. Good. Because I meet many young Russians who do not know who he is, and it's very upsetting. His name is Anatoly or Natan Sharansky. He has an incredible story. You should read it. He's written two books. 
and he was the prisoner of the secret Soviet visa. Basically, this one guy, together with this incredible wife, incredible wife, brought down the entire Russian curtain, really, right? As, as his wife pushed Ronald Reagan to push the Russians to allow him to the first refusenik, okay? And he says like this, in his book, Fear No Evil, which I highly recommend you read, I should make it compulsory reading. From the start of my investigation, the KGB told me that often, given my position with regard to this case, I would receive either capital punishment or at best 15 years of prison. What was his crime, by the way? Teaching Hebrew to Jewish men and women. That was it. And he didn't know that much Hebrew at that point. And that's what he was arrested for. For that crime in the former Soviet Union. They promised that if I changed my mind and cooperated with them in a struggle against Jewish activities, I would receive a short symbolic sentence and the opportunity to visit my wife in Israel. She moved the day before. But I did not change my position. He's standing in a court of law saying this. Five years ago, I applied for an exit visa to emigrate from the USSR to Israel. Today, I'm further from my goal. This would seem to be a cause of regret, but this is not the case. These five years were the best of my life. I'm happy to have lived them honestly and at peace with my conscience. I have said only what I believe and have not violated my conscience. A true Jewish hero. He was in solitary confinement for many, many years before they allowed him to that exchange on the bridge when he was allowed to leave, all right? And he, he says, Israel, the Jewish agency, very involved in Jewish politics. I feel part of a marvelous historical process, the natural revival of Soviet Jewry. This guy started it, and it's returned to the homeland, to Israel. My relatives know how strong my desire was to join my wife in Israel, right? They was put in solitary confinement. She managed to escape. And with what joy, at any moment, to exchange my so-called famous Jewish activist for a visa to Israel. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people, my people, have been dispersed all over the world and seemingly deprived of any hope of returning. But still, each year, Jews have stubbornly and apparently without reason said to each other, when? Pesach and Yom Kippur, the Shana Abba for Yerushalayim. He eventually, miraculously made it there. Miraculous. There's many incredible stories about him in the former OSSR and in Israel as well, but they're not for now. Right? The true true visionary. He was in solitary confinement for years and years, like 40 years they sent him, and yet he always thought of the future. Principle number four. Leaders learn. All leaders. Leaders must study more than others do. They read more than others do as well. We see this very interesting location. The Jewish king, according to Jewish law, has to do a mitzvah that nobody else has. What is that mitzvah? Writing two Torahs. The rest of us have to write one Torah. The Jewish king has to write two Torahs. One of them he writes, and he keeps in his palace. The other one he writes, and keeps, anybody know? On himself. Carried around a Torah with him the entire time. How? Great question. Different opinions. One opinion was, he literally carried a Torah, which is unlikely, because it could be pretty heavy, even a scroll without a wood and all the rest of it. The other opinion is, he had an entourage of people who would, uh, it's possible, the king all by himself, and one of them, among his entourage, he would have one of them carry. I read Ari Kaplan that says, have you seen a very small micro-writing? He writing they do, they make a lot of paintings out of it, and sfat, very small, small letters. He says he actually made a tour that was actually this big, about the size of your hand. And he would put it on a chain, and he would wear it around his neck, like Jewish bling. Why would he do that? Why would the Jewish king be told to always carry a Torah? We don't have to do that. If you want to, that's fine. But he's obligated to always have two Torahs. One he keeps in his palace, and one he keeps on himself. What do you think? Well, number one, What's he telling people? Let's say the, the, the President of America always carried a constitution with him wherever he went, which, by the way, is probably a good idea. Yeah, abide He's what? Yeah, abide I abide by it. I abide by it. all the amendments in. This is important to me. Right? This is what I'm thinking. Two. It's a book. I'm into learning. When I say that, it's not me saying it. I'm leading from this. Right? I have a guide that's always with me. Right? It's with you the entire time. 
I keep it with me. I'm learning from it. I'm constantly reading it. And this is what's leading me. And why one in the palace as well? So that he wouldn't turn around to one in his pocket and erase a little few words that he didn't like. Right? Oh, I don't like that. Or says he can't eat pig. Let's get rid of that. No, right? it reminds me that uh, initially I was always working with an alien book. Yes. I, every Israeli has a small thing. Right. I wish every Israeli had. Many Israelis do, yes. And also we have this uh, in the car. You, you uh, press the button and they sing for it to be left uh, on the road. <laughs> okay. Even okay. if on Shabbat. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, so when it says that he must write two Torahs, so basically he just has to rewrite the Torah and just carry Yes, it. copy that on one he kept in his palace and one he kept it himself. And he kept one himself and one in the palace so that he wouldn't change anything because then they would always compare it. The one in the palace says, you do, you can't eat pig. And you want something, says you can. So you always have to have a double check that was kept in the is palace. Is he actually the one to write it? Or? Good question. He probably was, but not necessarily. You can do what we do, called have a shaliach, <laughs> right? Someone who you nominate a sofer, a, a, a scribe, to write the Torah for him. He didn't actually have to write it himself. Okay? Okay, who took over for Moshe Rabbeinu? This is a depiction of Moses. That's something it looked like, right? And he's holding onto the head of Joshua. Actually, this process is called smicha. Smicha, which means to lean on something. And that's how in the olden days, they used to give rabbinical ordination, which actually technically does not even exist anymore because this doesn't exist anymore. It's like <laughs> Probably where they got it from. And they put their hands on the head and they would pass it on. This is rabbinical ordination. Moshe Rabbeinu did it. Why was Joshua chosen to take over? Who was more probable to take over from Moshe Rabbeinu than Joshua, who came from a different tribe, a different family? His own kids. Goshen and Eliezer. They were good kids. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu anoint his own kids to take over and to lead the Jewish people into Israel? Because Joshua had a virtue that they didn't have. That nobody had. And look at his virtue. He says, about why was jo Joshua chosen to take over Moses? Why were Lazar, Pinchas, and the seven sages not chosen? For they too possess great prophetic vision. It is because the responsibility of the Jewish people and the Torah could only be handed to a person who, from his youngest days, self sacrificed over the Torah in the tents of learning wisdom and through the acquired of a great name. Joshua was Moshe Rabbeinu's best student. He was the first to arrive, the last to leave. Why was he the first to arrive? To make sure all the seats and the chairs were comfortable and everything was put nicely together. And when he left, the people leave things somewhere, right? Everything was up, and he would wait, and he would ask questions, and he would clean up afterwards. Because of that, he had so much respect for learning, he took over for Moses. The most eager student, not necessarily the brightest. Didn't say Joshua was the best student. He was the most eager, and the most devoted to his master Moses, and therefore the best fellow to take on the mantle of leadership. From his earliest years, Joshua was the first to arrive with tents of learning, caring for all Moses' needs, clearing, preparing the chairs, and on. And that's why it says in Joshua chapter one, verse eight: "Keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night." That's what Moses was told. That's what Joshua was told, right? For him, the Torah was crucial. And when he went out to battle, before he went, he was always studying. He was always learning. You'll notice that great leaders always own lots and lots of books. That's what they're about. Look at some examples. They say second leadership. William Gladstone, one of the early British Prime Ministers, had a library of more than 30,000 books and had read 20,000 of them. Benjamin Disraeli, right, as well, both prolific writers, Winston Churchill wrote some 50 books and won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Mention that? He's the Prime Minister. You go to Ben Gurion's house in Tel Aviv, where I've been, and you'll see that there's such a library of 20,000 books. Look at it. Room after room after room. Study makes the difference between the states and the politician, between the transformative leader and the manager. If you want to be a great leader, you've got to read and read and learn, and that's what we Jews are very, very big into. Nearly finished. Principle number five of seven. Leadership means 
believing in the people you lead. You see, you aren't a leader unless you have people to lead. And the people aren't being led unless they have a leader. So you've got to have both. But if you want to be a good leader, you've got to believe in the people. By the way, whether you should be a synagogue, an organization, a corporation, whatever it is, a family. You're a parent, you're leading your kids. But you've got to believe in them. If you think they're losers, it ain't going to work for you. Rabbi, I read this quote once. They think uh, the great leader is someone who creates other leaders. Absolutely. A great leader is someone who creates leadership in others. Very, very good. God said, I have seen the affliction of my people that is in Egypt. And I've heard his outcry of his back. I will descend to rescue them from the hand of Egypt. Now go. I will send you to Pharaoh. I shall bring you up from the affliction of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses responded and said, But they will not believe me. And they will not hear my voice. They will say, Hashem did not appear to you. Good thing or bad thing? Why? That's doubting God. It's doubting God. But he's worse than doubting God. Was he doubting? Himself. Himself and the people. The people. They'll believe. Right? right? They will not heed my voice. No, they listened eventually. Eventually. They did. They came off. Oh, didn't say it's immediate. 80% of them saved them. That was their decision. His job to take out as many as were willing to come. Right? But he said it. Before he even knew, before he even knew, what happened to him because of this? No. No. That's what's hitting the rock. So he the rock. No. That's because he touched his tongue as a young boy. What was the plan? What happened because of this? Why would you speak Lashon Hara? What do you get? Leprosy. leprosy. Right? Sarat. Leprosy. Did Moshe get leprosy? Moses was shown three signs that he could show them. Number one, he said, God said his staff would change to a snake. Two, his hand became leprosy. Three, the water in the river would be poured on the dry land of enough blood. These two never happened. These two, ha this happened right away, but not later. He didn't use the fruit. The first one happened. When you see Pharaoh, the snake, remember this, the staff turned into a snake? That one happened. That's the only one needed to show them. But this one happened there and then. He put his hand, it came up, it was leprosy. Why leprosy? He spoke Lashon Hara about his people. And he said, they won't believe me. Rashi, the first two signs had a message from Moses as well. The staff which he had here in his hand, he was deserving to be hit with because he didn't trust his people. The snake appeared to prove to him he had spoken Lashon Hara because the snake, if you remember, spoke Lashon Hara in the Garden of Eden. And that's the original snake. They say the snake that appeared with Pharaoh later on and even there, at that moment, was the original snake of Gan Eden. It was terrifying. Terrifying for him. It was like a big snake was the snake. Original snake, yeah. The snake appeared to prove to him that he spoke Lashon Hara, about the Jewish people, like the snake in Gan Eden. Remember, the snake spoke Lashon Hara there as well. And the leprosy on his hand was also there to show him that he had spoken badly against his people. Because like leprosy, remember, in the Torah Tzorat, is a punishment for Lashon Hara. He, he cast doubt on the Israelites and was punished. The leader must have faith in the people. He or she leads. Yeah. Wasn't the snake uh, like in Ghana, it was the allegory of something? It was also a metaphor for the Yetzhara. Right. It was that as well. The evil inclination, the evil incarnate. But it reappeared. And he was told to grab it, remember? Yeah. They did, choose, but they spoke Lashon Hara as well. And the snake spoke in Lashon Hara as well. They had free will. They chose to do it. And he chose to speak. King David is famous for many things. But actually what he's most, really what he did incredibly, was he had great trust in people to create great leaders. Look at this. The Talmud tells us, a grandson of Moses named Yohanatan fell to the level of being the priest of an idol in order to support himself. I think this is, doesn't mean this should be a grandson, it can be more generations. So when King David later saw that money was very precious on that time, he found him stealing a lot of money. What would he do? He didn't tell him off, stop stealing, stop taking money. What did he do to him? He put him in charge of the temple's treasury. He says, you like money? That means you have good control over it as well. And he took this desire that he had for money to give him a job, a paid job also to run the finances. Where did King David learn this from? 
Where did King David learn that you've got to trust in people? Well, he had a great, 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 great grandmother. What was her name? Ruth. Ruth, one of those famous converts to Judaism. She was a Moabite. She was a Moabite. And King David's great, 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 great grandmother. And she also had an incredible power of trust that was handed down to King David. And it says in Elimelech, book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 3 to 10. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves marriage, Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. By the way, Oprah was going to be called this, but I've messed it up. That was actually meant to be called Orpah as a side point. Her two sons had also died. Naomi said to her two daughters, go return to your mother's house. Right, because they've lost their husbands. So Naomi had two sons, they married these two women, and they both died. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and left. Ruth cleaved to her. Naomi said, go home. And Ruth said, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your nation, that's my nation. Your God is my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And they went to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem. We learn out from this and the whole story of how a convert should act. But we can also learn about trust. Ruth had trust in Naomi that where she was going to go was the right place for her. That was part of the Davidic lineage. The King David, the, the king lineage is having trust in others. We got that from Ruth. Number six. Leadership involves a sense of timing and pace. You see, when Moses asked God to choose a successor, he says, May the Lord who gives breath to all living beings appoint someone over his community to go out before them and to come before them who will lead them out and bring them in. Why is it repetition? Right? Someone to community to go out before them, in before them, lead them out, bring them in. Why the repetition? Moses is saying two things about leadership. A leader must lead from the front. He or she must go out before them. But a leader can't be so far out in front when he turns around, no one's following. He must lead them out, meaning he must carry the people with him. He must go at a pace that can, people can bear. So the leader can be like, yeah, let's go. And he can run ahead, have great ideas, and no one's with him. What's the point? He does nothing. Right? You can't go too far ahead. Well, that's true. You can't be too far behind either. Right? It's not for you to complete the task, but now you're free to desist from it. So there's a delicate balance of impatience and patience. You've got to be a little impatient, because come on! But you've got to have some sablanot, teket, sablanot, right? Wait for the people. Go too fast, they resist and rebel. Too slow, they're not complacent. Transformation takes time. King David was a man of war, and wasn't allowed to build a temple. He was very upset about that. King David wanted to build a temple. Was he allowed to? No. He was a man of war, and the temple was a place of peace. So his son was allowed to. He didn't say, ah, I can't build it, I'm out of here. He built the foundations, he died, and then his son took over and finished the job. Sablanut. Menachem Begin, one of the greatest Jewish prime ministers, you should actually read the book, The Prime Ministers by Yehuda Avner. Compulsory reading for this course. Menachem Begin stayed in the opposition for many years until he was elected to lead. He just stayed and he waited and waited over a decade, I believe. He was in the opposition, and then his time came. He didn't push too hard, but didn't pull off either. Right? He was the ideal person that just waited for the right place and the right time. Many others would have given up. I'm not going to get it. He kept going, he became prime minister, and some of his decisions were the best. Can you email us a list of these books? Yes, I will email you a list of all these books. Mita Sharansky, Finn and Weevil, well worth reading. The Prime Minister, Yoda Avna, and my book, Jew Got Questions, which I'm going to bring in next week, God willing. I will add one more book. Yes. Start of Nation. What? Start of Nation. Yes. I also very good. Start of Nation. Also excellent. Excellent book. Thank you. <clears throat> and principle number seven. Leaders work on themselves and possess self-control. A very, very Jewish idea. You can't lead and be an animal and act disgustingly and do whatever you want. For us, great leaders have self-control. There's a wonderful book called the Kuzari. Now, some of you should have heard that book before. Kuzari, if you're Azerbaijani or Kafkazi, you've heard of the Khazar. Okay? This actually was a conversation. There was a book many years later, a fictional account of this original 
true story, which may or not be true, um, but most people say it is true, that occurred, about the king of Khuzar, Khazar, and he had a rabbi, and he had an imam, and a priest, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, and says, debate. Whoever wins the debate, my nation they're going to convert and become. And the debate happens, and eventually the Jew wins. Actually, because he wrote it, he added an intellectual as well, a philosopher. In the original account, there wasn't a philosopher. The king of Khuzari said, tell me how the upright and pious people of your religion behave. What are the, what are the upright people of Jewish people like? Okay. The rabbi said, an upright person is one who is concerned with his country, he provides for his citizens with every provision and need, he leads them justly, does not oppress any of them, does not give any of them more than his rightful share. He said, I asked you about an upright person, not a leader. I didn't ask you about that. I said, who's a tzaddik? And he started talking about a leader. The rabbi said, an upright person is a leader. All of his senses and attributes, both spiritual and physical, submit themselves to his command. He thus leads them, just like a real world leader. As it says, he who rules his spirit is greater than one that captures a city. As it says in the book of Proverbs, Mishle, he was saying, for us, Sidkut, being a righteous, pious Jew, is one who treats other people and leads them well. Which brings us to our final one. Nice time. We have to think globally. We're commanded to see the world and think, I want to make the world into a better place. But I can't change the world. There's so much going on. Who am I? A little person here in Brooklyn, Monty, Manhattan, wherever you are. You act locally. This actually was stolen by me from the Green Movement. They want to help to lessen uh, emissions and to recycle plastic. They say, think globally. How do I think globally? I act locally. I take one small bottle, I put that bottle, goes to recycle. My wife is obsessed with recycling. It goes to the garbage, she makes me take it out and put it to recycle. I'm like, is this one bottle gonna make a difference? She's like, maybe this one bottle won't, but this bottle with that bottle and that bottle and our entire community in our country will. You think globally, but you act locally. You wanna change the world, you change yourself. That brings us to the end of our seven principles of leadership. Any questions on anything we discussed so far? Great. We're going to take a break. Is there is there dinner now or is it too early? No, no, five minutes. Okay, five minutes break. And we're going to get back for one-on-one -on -one learning. Thank you, guys.